Hello, welcome to Convergent Dialogues. This is Xavier Bonilla. On this episode, I am very honored to have the wonderful Lev Parikian. Lev is a writer, conductor. Uh, he has written numerous books. Uh, most recently, he has written the fabulous book entitled Taking Flight, The Evolutionary Story of Life on the Wing. Uh, where it talks all about the different aspects of flight in different uh, animals. And uh, that was the that was the book that grabbed me, and I wanted to talk with him. And he was very kind to give me his time and, and knowledge and energy on, on, uh, on flight. We start by talking about convergent evolution for flight and what that looks like. We talk about the four forces of flight. We talk about early flight with the mayfly and a dragonfly. Vision and dragonflies. We talk about beetles, bees pterosaurs, birds and their many complexities, including the flightless ones, the speed of hummingbirds, we're talking about bats, um, and, uh, and, and so much more. I, I really had such a fun time with this conversation. It was obviously informational, and we're talking about different animals over time, but it felt like a, like a really nice conversation to have. And, and uh, you know, Lev is, is just uh, an absolute joy to talk to. Um, he has such a wonderful, wonderful amount of knowledge and uh, just a, a really good spirit and, and good perspective. And uh, I, I can't recommend uh, his book uh, highly enough. Uh, you can find this conversation and all other conversations at convergingdialogues.substack.com. It's all, I'm also on YouTube. So subscribe, follow, share widely. And now I bring you Lev Parikian. I am here with Lev Parikian. Uh, Lev, uh, thanks so much for uh, coming on the podcast. I'm uh, very, uh, very thrilled to to talk with you. Thanks so much. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me um, to talk. But this is my first American podcast, so I'm is really it? pleased to be reaching out across the sea. Oh, very, very nice. So, so they love you over there across the pond, but uh, you haven't quite made it over here on on the U.S. side, huh? <laughs> not, not yet. But we okay. know, perhaps this could be this could be the beginning of it. Okay, there we go. I love it. I love it. <laughs> So um, you have a you have a book uh, that is out. It's called Taking Flight: The Evolutionary Story of Life on the Wing. Um, super super awesome. I really really enjoyed it. And and I think a, a few few folks are doing this now. I don't know if it's a publisher thing, but it's a small book. So it's like a like a coffee table size book, uh, but it's packed with so much good information. Yeah, it's, it's great writing. I really really enjoyed it. I probably read it in one or two sittings. I really really uh, liked it a lot. Um, before we get into it, why don't you just tell folks uh, who you are, what your uh, professional or academic background is, and uh, why you uh, got interested in writing this book? Yeah, so it's um, so my profession really for many years has been as a musician, firstly as an uh, orchestral musician playing timpani and percussion as a freelance, and then um, going from the back of the orchestra to the front uh, as an orchestral conductor. And so I've been doing that for 25 something years. 30 wow. years uh, in in and around London with a variety of community orchestras, youth orchestras, the odd professional thing here. So that's been a good a good thing for me. Um, and about seven years ago, I wrote a sort of semi memoir nature kind of thing uh, called "Why Do Birds Suddenly Disappear," which is based on the return of my passion for bird watching, birding. Uh, in in middle age, I've been a very keen uh, bird watcher in my youth as a child, and then it disappeared, and then it came back again. So I thought I'd write a, a, a year's quest to see two hundred species of British bird in a year, and it was it was great fun. And I sprinkled it through with memories from my childhood, my musical upbringing with my father, who was also a musician, and and that sort of thing. Um, and as a result of that, I've just done more and more. Uh, nature writing really i've been invited to to write a couple of uh general nature books by my publishers um and then this one has really sprung from that and it's probably more in the popular science slash nature vein isn't it i think is the, the the ones that um followed wider birds suddenly disappear have been uh on the lines of middle-aged man goes out <laughs> looks at nature, looks at the people who are looking at the nature and frames it around that. Uh, on this occasion, it was really, it came from uh, questioning myself um, 
what exactly was it that I really, really loved about birds? Well, you know, trying to deconstruct it a little bit and go, okay, so I know, I know, I, you know they're, they're amazing, but what's more than that? And the, the first basic answer that came to me was that they can fly. And so then I asked myself some more questions, you know, about, well, okay, so I know they can fly and that's amazing, but they all fly in different ways and how do they do that and why do they do it and how long have they been doing it for and which are the good ones and which are the bad ones and what else flies. And so in each question, um, basically, uh, I didn't know the answers. And so I um, looked them up and then each answer led to another question. And uh, before too long, there we had an idea for a book, which you now hold in your hand. And as for the as for the academic um, uh, aspect of it, I'm really uh, not an academic uh, science person at all. I've, I've come to this literally from the, the point of view of a layman, uh, in a you know, much in the manner of Bill Bryson, who of course is very you know very popular around here. Um, uh, just kind of wandering around, asking loads of questions and being generally curious about stuff and then trying to write about it in a way that uh, somebody like me would be able to understand. I think that's just that's what underpins it all. So uh, I know you've had some incredibly eminent scientists as your guests, so I'm a little bit nervous about that aspect of this. Oh, <laughs> no, 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 no. Don't don't be nervous at all. What <laughs> One of the things I've I've realized uh, doing this for for a while is is everyone is is uh, is a human and their perspective is all great and you know I think everyone is uh, everyone's work speaks for itself and so your your book is, yeah. is, is is fabulous. I actually had a conversation with somebody recently who wrote a kind of popular science book mm. and she's she's not like a, a scientist formally and we talked mm. about this a little bit and we talked about how <clears throat> it's obviously you want to get things uh, facts about 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 science accurate and correct as best as possible and do all the good research for it but there's something about having um people that are maybe not in the field or maybe adjacent to the field in some way be able to communicate i don't think everybody in science <clears throat> uh, physical or social sciences is meant to write these kinds of books for a wide audience they're just it's just not yeah. it's not their it's not their skill. They can't do it. Some people try and it's it just fails terribly. And so I think having really good, um, thoughtful folks like yourself writing things like in this way, so everyone can kind of understand it, but kind of distilling a lot of the information so it's acceptable but accurate, I think is mm. is is tremendous and it's a, it's an absolute need. So I, I think um, you know, yes, there's there's a lot of great researchers out there, but um, I think the the work that that you're done in, in the book is is stuff that we need more of as well. So oh well, that's uh, that's, that's, that's good. To know. I'm, I'm glad you agree because that's what I think as well. And <laughs> having obviously having read a lot of uh, uh, science books um, on various subjects in uh, nature in general, and uh, for this book, I've you know, read around it a lot in terms of in in areas that um, were not familiar to me. Mm -hmm, <laughs> so. Mm -hmm. Uh, really interesting seeing the, the the range of approaches taken by people who have spent their lives immersed in the field mm -hmm. uh, or the various fields. Mm -hmm. And of course, some of the books aren't aimed that, that I you know you read as you're researching or paper scientific papers. Then I'm as a general reader right. anyway, so right. that's fine. Right. Um, but there was one I did one did spring to mind. I can't remember which book it was, but it literally in the first chapter, and it was supposed to be a sort of uh, the science of flight made kind of easy. And in the first uh, chapter, it said something like, you will, of course, remember the equation and such and such and such from your high school. <laughs> I will not remember that at all. Thanks, pal. You know? Nope. <laughs> <laughs> <All the time. laughs> but, then, but then, of course, you, you know, you learn. Um, and well, the, other, the other interesting thing was seeing, because whenever you pitch a book, um, you, you have to do your due diligence and, kind of see has anybody done this before and if so have how have they done it and have they done it in the same way and uh, your heart sinks you, know, you have a brilliant idea so then you go to google and you look it up that around the subject and you go okay so so and so has just literally got this coming out in the next month and they go <laughs> shelve it right. um, but I, I didn't find anything certainly not in the uk that was doing doing what this book attempted to do, which is to see the whole big picture and bring together 
a, a, a chunk of evolution, a chunk of sort of basic um, aerodynamics, a chunk of nature, a little bit of anecdotal stuff and personal experience, mm. um, doing it in that way. So that was a, a huge relief when I discovered that. Mm-hmm. And, uh, mm-hmm. and then we managed to sort of mold it into something that was mm-hmm. uh, more or less coherent. So. Yeah, yeah, I, I like how the book is organized. As I said, it's you know, it's a, it's a good size, and it's you can mm. kind of read. You know, if you're a slow reader, or you just take your time. You could read each chapter almost as like its own kind of thing, which is nice. And right. Yeah. It, it goes well together, but it, it also is nice. So yeah, I mean, I, I, I sort of tried to top and tail it with, the, mm. I, I, and here's the thing I saw, and and then at the end, either a kind of okay, well, and that's that, or. But you think that's amazing, but look at this. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. Exactly. So I guess the um the one thing here, so so what so the to be clear, it's it's about uh, there's a lot of birds in here, obviously, because you know, we birds uh uh there's many birds and they fly, or most fly. Yeah. Um but there's other other animals as well, insects, things like yeah. that, which we'll get to. But one of the things about birds, I'll I might bring this up again when we get there, but <clears throat> When when I realized I've said this before, but when I realized that uh, birds are dinosaurs, um, mm. it, it just changes your. I'll be I'll be sitting outside in, in my mm. in my in my backyard or on my porch or whatever, or I'll be out somewhere and I'll just see birds, different types of birds, and it's like wow, like there's just there's this like there's this thread that goes through, and they're they're still among us and how they move their mm. head and how they're bipedal and how they you know they get food and how they you know communicate and how they remember yeah. things and then it just becomes like it, it, you always i can when i was a kid i was like oh god why do all those old people just do bird watching that sounds like <laughs> such a boring thing to do now i totally yeah. get it maybe that's just cuz i'm older now and i'm like oh no, now exactly. i get it there now i know what it is but like it you kind of are like wow and so one of these things yeah. is flight which is which is really interesting so yeah. Uh, I guess, tell how how do you see this in terms of like, you know, flight is usually seen as a feature of convergent evolution, right? Which yeah. Is basically, a one uh, feature evolves at different times for different species. Flight is yeah. a big one. Um. So what what do you make of of this aspect that flight has evolved at different times for different species, and how flight evolving at different points can tell us about some of these similarities between the animals that fly? So obviously. You know, bats are different from insects, and birds are different from pterosaurs. Like, how does how does the idea of flight kind of give a kind of connective tissue, if you will, between these animals? Well, is it, I mean, that's it's interesting is because, funny enough, even though it, obviously it is all about convergent evolution, I don't think I, I I really mentioned that explicitly in the book. I think mm-hmm. I leave that for the reader to draw the oh, like, okay, so they've done the same thing. Oh, they did the same thing. Mm-hmm. I, mean, I, I suppose the 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 one fundamental simil- anatomical similarity is in wings mm-hmm. um and wings are wings are wings there's obviously there are different shapes and sizes but really all you, you know what you do need for powered flight is a couple of airfoils um that are gonna give you lift simply by their existence you mm-hmm. know uh and then you need to power them in some way and so but the but, but uh, so all the things that uh un, um indulge in or undertake powered flight they have these things on their on their bodies um and i suppose the 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 main there's similarities and differences that the uh in the case of uh pterosaurs birds and bats in order of their evolution that's the, the chronological order those are all um uh modified forelimbs modified arms mm-hmm. with insects it's a different thing because they made the wings out of the stuff they're Body is made of, so it grew. It they, they, the, the chitin they adapted and evolved the wings from out of their body, as it were, rather than something that was pre-existing and that uh, turned into something that was useful for flight. Um, and I, obviously, there are. We should, I should clarify that the book is predominantly about powered flight. Uh, so there's uh, all sorts of things that will spend some of their time in the air, and they're on the spectrum of flight. And the one thing, the, the rule of thumb uh, I've developed is that if uh, a, the name of an animal has the word flying in it, uh, you can bet it's not actually 
flying properly. <laughs> it's a, that's going to be a gliding thing. <laughs> uh, so, you know, you know, flying squirrels, flying fish, flying squids, fly all of those things, they're, they're getting in the air somehow, but they're not staying there. Mm -hmm. uh, they're, they're exploiting the aerodynamic properties and, and have either things that help them stay up a little bit longer um, uh, or they, they you know, like flying snakes can amazingly sort of turn their whole bodies into a sort of temporary airfoil and then wriggle to, mm -hmm. make, to make, them, make themselves go further. So uh, the, those, those th that's the thing that they have in common. And the, the, the big divide is between the invertebrates and the vertebrates. And, of course, uh, the invertebrates, the insects, came first. They were the first ones to do it. Um, but, you know, the other thing that occurs to me is that uh, animals haven't evolved the equivalent of the rotors of a helicopter in the same way. I mean, they, the, the wings work in a similar kind of way. So they work uh, not like fixed wings of a, a airplane, airplanes. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, unless you count the portrayals of Snoopy in the Peanuts cartoons when his ears turn into these fantastic <laughs> helicopter rotors, right. but you, they don't have helicopter rotors like that. <laughs> so, uh, but yeah, the, the, the convergent evolution thing is there everywhere across the uh, across the whole spectrum of the flying things and within birds, for example. You know, you get the, you, know, you may have heard the squealing of swifts, which just were flying mm -hmm. past my window, mm -hmm. and and so they are very similar to the swallows and martins, but they're not actually related. They mm -hmm. come you know, come at it from the same angle. So those are those are the the, the things that occurred to me. And, and I suppose it's interesting in, in that um, the, the development of wings of different shapes and sizes, that's the one way there is to do it in the animal kingdom, yeah, with many, many, many variations. But mm -hmm. that's basically what you need, is yeah. you need to sprout something that is going to keep you in the air with, with different methods. Yeah, mm. yeah. yeah. So you, you, you talk about four groups of animals that have flight. Now, I... Yeah. I mean, I'm I uh I'm not sure are were there well, I guess what was the intention behind these four groups? So the four groups are insects, pterosaurs, birds, and bats. Mm -hmm. Were there other, I guess, groups that you wanted to include, or that that about sums it up? Those are about the big four people usually think but of. Those are the big four that have unequivocally evolved mm -hmm. uh flight. Mm -hmm. Of course, we don't know whether certain things might yet be on that road. So you know, we take, for example, the flying squirrels, which are mm -hmm. the Borneo mm -hmm. forest. They have got these quite uh, impressive sort of membranes uh, linking their four limbs and their hind limbs, which they can sp spread out their arms and legs, and that turned into quite a nifty little parachute thing to get them from the top of one tree to the top of another tree quite some distance away. Now, we have no idea, obviously, uh, whether that might not be a stage, a step on the way to developing powered flight, which might become useful to them in the future. So, you know, see you in a couple of million years. <laughs> um, <laughs> we'll, we'll check back in and see, see how but far they've got. It's very likely that flight has evolved at different points, that it will again at some other point yeah. millions of years from now. So it'd be yeah. interesting to see the, the, the environmental uh pressures that will push that or not or whatever is very of interesting course, yeah. yeah um okay so so let's so before we get to these uh the grouping so the kind of book kind of mm. works this way you have certain chapters for you know uh insects and pterosaurs and birds and everything yeah um let's talk about i guess just flight and you talk about four forces of flight um lift thrust weight and drag i think at yeah. different points in the in the book you talk about to maybe we'll, we'll bring it up when we talk about the particular animal but um how there's like gliding and soaring and actual flying and the differences mm -hmm. and similarities so but just tell us about these four forces of flight because that will be instructive for when we talk about it in different animals yeah, so it's it's really it's just those four uh, fundamental forces that really act on any flying object, whether it's an aeroplane or a, a, a hummingbird. Um, and so you've got lift, which is obviously it's upward force, uh, thrust, which is basically forwards force, uh, weight, which understandably is downwards force and will bring you down or mass, uh, and then drag, which is pulling you backwards. And so there's there's various combinations. Yeah, that's four very simple concepts. But of course, the the reality of it is that it's an incredibly complex mixture of those things. But I suppose the the one thing to point out about it is that if you think of it in comparison with uh, an aeroplane, 
that in an, in an aeroplane, the wings are fixed and are providing lift by the very act of existing once they've got you know uh, air underneath them. Um, but the, it's the engines that provide thrust and they have to produce enough of those two forces to counteract the ones that are stopping it weight and drag. Um, but with with all animals in flight, what they're doing is they're producing both lift and thrust, a combination of those two things, with the same thing, which is the wings, which are powered by the muscles. So, so that is uh, one fundamental difference. And of course, that led to a big understanding. We're sort of jumping a little bit, but the old um, the the old saying that you may have heard as a kid was that you know bumblebees are too heavy to fly, which is it's in the first line, it's in the first minute of the the DreamWorks movie, B movie. Mm -hmm. Hey, bumblebees are too heavy to fly, but still they do it anyway. Mm -hmm. um, but that calculation was made by a, a Frenchman in the 1930s uh, called Antoine Magnon in, uh, in a book he wrote. Uh, and it was using what the understanding was at the time, but it, it failed to take into consideration the fact that insects are flapping their wings mm -hmm. rather than they're just having them stationary. Obviously, he knew they flapped their wings, but he thought the the, the laws applied in the same way. But uh, as we discovered since then, it's rather more complicated than that. And uh, so, those are the those are basically the the four the, the the four forces. But as I said, there's all sorts of complex vortices and and wakes and sort of swirling nonsense affecting an animal's ability to fly. Uh, some of you know, a lot of which will be to do with the action of flapping the wings. So the very act of putting a wing through the air that's creating uh, that's creating uh, airflow, uh, swirling airflow maybe um, over the wings, uh, which complicates matters. Mm, yeah. So let's let's go through. I guess the four groups. Um, <clears throat> we'll start with insects. So um you, you say in the book we don't know obviously who was you know what's the first animal or whatever to fly we don't know that but maybe the mayfly was was early um and so you talk about the mayfly and the dragonfly um yeah. do you, you tell us you, you talk about um the kind of Devo, D devonian or, or carboniferous period was maybe as important here but tell us i guess about what these two insects tell us about flight, whether it's early flight, you know, pre pre uh, progenitors of of, of mm -hmm. how the modern day we know, and then what is it unique about them, um, you know, respectively uh, about how they 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 fly? Sure. Uh, so what we do have um, is the, the the first unequivocal winged fossil that we have is a thing called Delichala bitterfeldensis, which um, oh, people get confused by scientific names. This that one is simply just the combination of two places between which it was near which it was found mm. in Germany, Delich and Bitterfeld. So you go to Delich and Bitterfeld, and you'll find the, um, the place where this fossil was found, and that dates from about three hundred and twenty-five million years ago. Um, and it is uh, an outline of a wing that looks really very similar to a mayfly's wing or a dragonfly's wing. So you, you can see the veining that's got spots on the wings. You can see the delicacy of the, the veining, even though it's rather simpler than a dragonfly's wing. And you can see the curve of its, um, you can see the curve of the wing, uh, of the wings. Um, so that's what we have. And before that, there's this very, um, tantalizing gap of about 60 million years known as the hexapoda gap mm -hmm. uh, where not only are there no there's no clue of what led to insects like that uh, in terms of the the development of wings but there's really very little in the way of insect fossils at all uh, of any kind so um with uh, with some things you can go okay so we have this and then this and then this and then this and then we can join the dots quite quite easily um despite the you know the the, the paucity of the of the fossil record but with the those first insects there's really nothing there's a go back to 400 million years and there are a couple of things that have body parts that look similar to things that fly today so they've kind of extrapolated that and they have flown but with the delicata bit of is the first one um and it those early those early flyers the paleodictyopterans would have been 
very similar in uh, in body build to what we now have a body plan to what we now call mayflies and dragonflies, mm. which have been around for not as long as that, but though you know, so uh, 190, 200 million years in various forms. Um, and mayflies and dragonflies are united in one particular aspect, which is that uh, the way their uh, wings work and the way the muscles work on the wings is very intuitive and simple. It's the way you or I might, if we you know, build a flying thing, you just get one muscle to pull to pull down on the wing, which makes it go up, and another antagonistic muscle to, which pulls up on the wing to make it go down. And the muscles are directly connected to the wings. And in that, they are for current day insects they're in the minority because the vast majority of uh, insects have a slightly more uh, complex um, system whereby their uh, their bodies uh, contract and pull and contract which uh, sets off some muscles which then set off another set of muscles which pulls the wings down so these are it's a, uh, a system where the the movements of the muscles are not uh, directly connected to the electrical, the nervous impulses that that started, but they set themselves off, as it were. Once they're going, that'll um, set themselves off and get the wings going. And the result of that is that the wings can go um, uh, much more efficiently and much more quickly. But the, the, amazing, the thing I find uh, amazing about the dragonflies in particular is is how incredibly good at flying they are, given that they're you know primitive apparatus that they're equipped with. It works astonishingly well, and that is at least in part to do with the the sophistication of their, their sort of nervous system and their optical system, um, and the brains that their brains that can process all this information, so that they can uh, they have two pairs of wings. The 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 wings are depending on the, the species, dragonflies and damselflies. They are, you know, the same family. They are each built in subtly different ways, but in general, the two pairs of wings are roughly the same size. Um, and the the fantastic thing about them is that they have uh, individual control, basically over all four wings separately. So they can flap the front wings at a different speed to the back wings. They can flap them so in, in, in starting at the same time but going different speeds, or they can flap them at the same speed but offset by a quarter of a wing stroke, for example, mm-hmm. or they can do the same thing with the left and the right, mm-hmm. uh, and so on. So this makes them uh, super maneuverable, and obviously uh, the you know some of the most effective hunters in the animal kingdom. Uh, with with mayflies, it's a different uh, thing because they don't have similar sized wings. They have um, quite good good sized fore wings, but the hind wings are uh, much smaller. So they're basically doing all their most of the, the, the the flying is basically done with one pair of wings. But they don't need to do very much for because a mayfly, um, well, it has it's unique in one respect. There's about three thousand species of mayfly. Um, and they share one thing which is unique, which is that they have two adult flying stages. So that the larva is, lives in the water for a couple of years and it's growing and growing through a, a load of stages. And then when the time comes, it floats up to the top, chucks off its outer its, its, its outer skeleton, which it doesn't need anymore, and it turns into the uh, the imago, which is the, the first, this sort of immature stage. And that sits on the surface of the water, and it has wings, which it hardens a bit, and then it flies from the surface of the water to a perch on the uh, the water you know, on the edge of the river, say. Um, and then it go undergoes another metamorphosis to the adult, which will then go through the process of mating. And so, uh, and really, that's all they use flight for is firstly to get away from danger on the surface of the water and then for the mating process. And then they very quickly die, as you know, famously may fly as live for a day or maybe a few, but even sometimes just a few hours. So uh, they've got the very similar apparatus, but they're using them uh, for very different um, goals compared mm-hmm. to dragonflies. In terms of the the dragonfly, I guess the one thing you mentioned in there is also about uh, vision. 
Um, mm. And I think some people, you know, if you've seen a documentary or something like that, you, you, you sometimes people will highlight this as well. Obviously, what is it about their incredible vision um, that is helpful for them, but also distinct, uh, even distinct from 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 uh, vision in humans? And this is a maybe a deeper question, which which you you, you can. You I'm know, not good. At, I'm not good at deep questions. You can <laughs> you can avoid it if you want, but um, <laughs> I guess the question though there is is like you know in in terms of um you know a metaphysical claim is you know what what does that what is that like if you literally have it, in terms of the the mechanics of vision you see Ooh. the world literally different than other organisms or other animals mm. you know it, it, it that you know it, it makes you stop and think about it where it's like an, an, uh, an, a creature this small has if you will vision i don't want to say better or worse but mm. more enhanced let's say than than humans or other things and it's like wow like the world looks completely different than how yeah. you and i see it walking around that's a powerful thing to think about in such a small animal it's not what we would call vision in a way, is it? I mean, uh, it's uh-huh, so, right. so, you know, the, the, so they, they, they have dragonflies, um, a good example of this because they have the more, the, one of the more extreme examples of the, the compound eye. Um, and they are, um, as I understand it, I think the dragonfly's eyes are, uh, in proportion to the size of their body, I think they're the biggest in the animal kingdom. And you will see, if you see a dragonfly perch somewhere, you'll be able to, or if you look on YouTube or look at photographs, you can see how big they are and how prominent they are. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, when you see, I, I think they're extraordinarily beautiful things, especially damselflies, which are more sort of delicate. And, uh, but, and I was on a walk yesterday and I saw some banded demoiselles over a canal uh, out in Wiltshire. And they are just arresting things because of the, the way the light catches them that sort of metallic blue or whatever color it might be um and then when they go down to perch you can get as close as possible and and have a look at you know even with the naked eye you can see that the 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 way they're the the shape of their head um so the eyes uh as compound eyes and they're made up of um thousands of facets each one of which has its own lens and someone i've read that somebody actually uh, spent a long time counting the facets on a green uh, green dana um, dragonfly, which I think is a species common in the states, and it was something like twenty seven thousand. Mm. So you think of these twenty seven thousand uh, little lenses packed into this tiny, by our standards, this tiny space, all so intricately arranged, um, so that the insect can have pretty much all round vision they have to move their heads to to see behind them but the, it gives them really they can see obviously forwards and up and down and to the left and to the right and each of those lenses it's not doing what our what our eyes do as you say it's it's building up a a, a composite picture of the world of actually a very quite a simple picture of the world but one of, of enormous detail the same thing seen 27,000 times mm. um so uh what it what it means they they are extraordinarily good at is picking up movement detecting something moving um they may not be able to see exactly what it is but they will they they register it mm. um, and i think the other thing to, to sort of uh to highlight it of this is that those all of those facets that aren't uh, seeing uh, to the same level of clarity. There are some that are better than others. So the the ones that are so called uh, in the the acute zone, um, which which is where they will really pick up in the most sharp detail and be able to react on so quickly. Um, and then I think they're they're particularly good at seeing movement uh, above them. Mm. so they will uh attack from underneath mm. which is uh, it's a pretty nifty thing to be able to do to something because uh, you know there'll, mm. there'll be things that, that just literally won't know what hit them mm-hmm. <laughs> um, mm-hmm. uh, because it's come from in their in their blind spot uh, potentially um but as well as those facets uh in the in the compound eye they have uh three 
um, things called ocelli. I think it's pronounced ocelli. It's the Italian word, so I'd say or, ocelli. I don't know. O c e double l i, and they're arranged in a triangle um, on the top of the head, um, and they're light sensitive. And I, the, the the consensus seems to be that that they are used to help with balance in flight, so that they, you know, it's like a gyroscope type thing. Um, and so the, the the other thing is that, of course, that the, the eyes are producing information to the brain, and then the brain is processing it and sending signals to the, the wings to, to act on this. And, of course, because they're small, the the distances involved for these electrical signals is very extremely small, and that's one of the things that enables them to go so quickly uh, towards towards whatever core uh, unfortunate thing they're about to catch in their claws. Yeah, yeah, it's 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 it's, it's such a marvel, and it's it, especially something like vision um, and how important it is. And while there's difference, there's there's so much there that is 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 deeply fascinating. Mm in terms of how you're perceiving the world and, and what that looks like and interacting and, and what it allows you to do. And it's, I, I find it, I find it super, yeah. super interesting. I, th- I think to, to answer your metaphysical point, I think the, the, that it, that really tells us something about the way we see the world because we inevitably perceive the world from our own point of view. That was obviously that's a given, but it takes, it helps us imagine what it might be like if we actually want to imagine what it might be like even temporarily to be something else and uh, and it gives us this perspective so it's not just the sense of that um the the kind of vision but the sense of scale mm-hmm. so you know, we we are we can only ever see things from a human scale and so to, to think about something that is that small yeah. And it, actually, dragonflies are pretty big, but you know we can go on to uh, fruit flies if you want, um, which are so you know, uh, extraordinarily uh, tiny um, by our standards, and yet they have these complex systems of, of muscles uh, powering and steering and uh, and enabling them to um, to fly in incredibly nimble and agile ways. But all on a tiny kind of scale, you know, like the film Inner Space. It's like you just go. So this is, and it's uh, the great thing about this is you don't need to take drugs to to, to think about it. You, <laughs> you're not like you're not like kind of going, oh well, man, there's something in my finger now. You, you're actually so you just need to look at the insect um, and 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 just lay your imagination to do the work, and then think, okay, so perhaps if I can think about what it might be like to be a dragonfly then perhaps I might be able to think about what it's like to be another human being. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so it's a, it's a potential, without wanting to be pretentious about it, it's a potential gateway to empathy, mm-hmm. uh, the ability to just to, to, to you know, step back from yourself for a few seconds and go, okay, here's the thing. It's incredibly successful at what it does. It's been around way longer than we have in pretty much this this form. So perhaps that's something that we can just lodge in our heads and consider for a bit. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I absolutely agree. You, uh, <laughs> you, uh, you also talk about beetles. Uh, I was mm. kind of blown away by this. They, they, they make up 25% of all animals. Is there that yeah, many out there? It, it's crazy. There's unbelievable, unbelievable number, more than that's 400. Wild. It's, the, and these are things that, they, that they've discovered and they've given a name to. It's crazy. There was a lovely comment by a British um, biologist uh, called Haldane, and he was uh, one of those people who was you know, asked to give talks about various things in the 19th, 20th century, early 20th century. And he um, was asked about, as I think scientists were, were and are, to make the, the thought about what, uh, you know, what created all this and what kind of... Um, supreme being or creator what the nature of that supreme being might be and he pondered and he said "Hmm, yes well all i can say is that uh, whoever it he or she is they must have had an inordinate fondness for beetles (laughs) 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 because there's so damn many of them so uh yeah four hundred thousand plus um with more still to come, um, as you say, 40 percent uh, of all insects, twenty five percent of all uh, living species, incredible diversity, 
Um, and they, uh, uh, I mean, the reasons for that success are probably more complex and varied. But the fundamental thing that they did to their um, to their anatomy was that they they had the, their ancestors will have had two wings, two set two pairs of wings. And they figured, okay, so we can fly okay with one pair of wings. Obviously, they didn't figure this because it's evolution, but you just work with me. Um, we can fly with one pair of wings. So what we can do is we can uh, re-develop uh, the front pair of wings into something that can protect us, and protect our bodies and the, the, and our, our wings. So well, the beetles have this in common, which is they have the, these hardened cases, protective cases called elytra. Um, and if you see um, a, a ladybird, ladybird beetle, uh, for, for an example, that's fairly universal, you go up close to it in the spring or summer and you see it crawling on a leaf and then it'll pop open. The front wings, the carapace will pop open like the front doors of the DeLorean. Um, and then und- and it'll, they'll just hold them there. And then the back wings do the actual the actual mm-hmm. flying, mm-hmm. and off it goes. Mm-hmm. In a kind of ungainly way, because they've got the they've got the cabin doors open, as it were. Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. Um, but they that's all they need because they don't need to do great big long uh, fast journeys. They just need to get from here to that nice rotten bit of wood or that leaf over there. So uh, in general, a lot of them are you know, doing quite short journeys um but what those enable them to do is um you know the, the fundamental property of that is protection um so it was incredibly useful they could burrow into things they could bury themselves under leaf litter or in the earth or under bark particularly um in, or in any kind of safe crevice so that if there was a huge storm or a flood or a fire or a volcano erupting nearby, they would be safer than the ones who are out in the open and their wings wouldn't be so damaged. So I think about the mayflies and the dragonflies, their wings were sticking out and uh, vulnerable to anything that was uh, uh, they might catch them on. Um, so that, and they, they also are incredibly effective protecting against the, 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 the wet um and the heat and the cold um so this means that they're 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 very compact little things beetles aren't they in general they you know they are self-contained and if you pick up a beetle of any kind then you'll probably just annoy it whereas if you try to pick up a moth you'll you'll squash it and probably kill it so that uh, that resilience um, uh, it seems to have been a big factor in their success and ability to diversify and radiate so well. Yeah, it's it's, it's interesting because already you can tell we were talking about the dragonflies and how their wings are and how they fly, and now already with the with the the, the ladybugs, you can you can, mm. you can see the difference, right? Already the difference. It's still flight, but it's 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 different and, and different for yeah. the makeup and the biology and the in the of, of the body, and then also where they're at and what they're using it for. It's just very interesting. Yeah. It is. And, and of course, within when you've got so many uh, thousands of species, mm-hmm. then there'll obviously be an enormous amount of variation of how it how it's used um, or not used. So there's, I mean, at one extreme, there's a species called the uh, ironclad beetle, which is uh, flightless, but has it developed its elytra and the, to, to such an extent that it is a tough it's a one of the toughest things you could you could drive over it in a four by four and it'll be fine mm-hmm. you could you know so that's the the uh the one extreme that it went to and then there are all sorts of other kinds of beetles which actually have quite flimsy elytra but are very flitty and there are others that will might just actually use their wings for skating across the water uh, uh, and so on. So you've got these this enormous variation, and also in the in the sort of the the, the decoration of it, there'll be beetles that uh, decorate their uh, elytra quite uh, radically, either to uh, maybe attract a mate or especially to to warn any potential predator that, that they're that they're not good to eat. Um, so uh, the more the more you the more you have these uh, variations, of course, the more the more diversity there'll be in those shapes and sizes. Mm, yeah. So you you also mentioned uh, bees. So I've uh, I've talked to um, 
uh, Lars Chitka. He wrote a book called The Mind of a Bee. It's great. I like so. Cool. Yeah, yeah. We, so you know, pe- listeners can 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 listen to the two hours on on bees <laughs> and their cognition and their sociality and their vision and all of these things that they're, mm-hmm. they're really good at. Um, from from your uh, perspective in the book, I, I liked a lot of what you what you what you wrote about them, bees and wasps. They've been around mm-hmm. since the Jurassic, and they've mm-hmm. diversified so much to, uh, today. For in, in terms, and there's different types of bees, obviously, and things yeah, like yeah, that. How do we understand their wings? You mentioned the bumblebee already earlier, but mm-hmm. how do you how do you how do we understand how they? F- fly or are they gliding more what because when i look at bees in my my flower bed they're not mm. flying per se it's interesting well, they are i mean they are flying but but again the, i think the great thing with bees and i presumably we, we have some, some similar species you know yeah bumblebee it's, it's a decent size so you can kind of see it mm-hmm. whereas with a, a, a mid or a fly you may not be able to see but you can probably see you might be able to see some sort of motion of the wings Right, right. Um, 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 but they do have that kind of so, some of the, especially the bumblebees. They have this sort of um, weird kind of flight. I know what you mean because you don't actually yeah. see what's making them do it, but they are kind of fl- looks like they're floating sometimes mm-hmm, in a, mm-hmm. in an aimless kind of way. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. Mm-hmm. But yeah, it's they, like a, it's they, like almost like a zigzag in the air, almost. Yeah, right. Yeah. yeah. So the, they'll the, they are definitely flying, um, and of course sometimes they'll be they'll be hovering. Um, uh, to get themselves into uh, into the flower to, to to position themselves, they're not the arch hovers, but they'll do that, and they will use their wings. Uh, and it depends on the, again the species, but let's take the honeybee as an example because that's the most. Um, and uh, so the, the honeybee is quite a, quite an exception in a way because uh, it has um, it's flapping its wings at. Uh, something like between 200 and 230 beats per second, which, you know, exactly. You kind of, you say, you, you throw these things out like the, when you say, oh, it's just 250 million years ago, you should, what? <laughs> say it again. You know, so 200, between 200 and 230 times a second, mm-hmm. um, which again, in terms of human scale, that's kind of I mean, ridiculous. That, that's 230 beats per minute is fast. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so you, you, you <laughs> time 60 of that is crazy. Yeah. Right? I used to be a drummer, so I'm kind of going, yeah. how fast are you trying to yeah, relate yeah. it to, to how fast I can play a role, you know? <laughs> right, right, exactly. <laughs> okay. Even the but most we, talented drummers, <laughs> I mean, over 200 is it's nuts yeah. beats per minute. I mean, it's nuts. Um, B- B- Billy Cobham might have done it, but so, no, <laughs> it is, uh, um, it's, it's not what we're designed to to think about or to be able to do. So, the, but but the even more amazing thing I think about that is that um, so that's that's fast. That's the same speed, approximately, give or take, uh, that the fruit fly is flapping its wings at. And then you think about the size of a honeybee, which is pretty small. But then you think of a fruit fly, and they go, okay, so that's a different order. If a honeybee is actually something like eighty times heavier. Than a fruit fly, and intuitively you'd think, well, in order to, um, you know, to, to be able to do it, it's not going to be able to, f- to f- flap its wings as fast. Intuitively, the smaller the flyer, the faster its wings are going to be uh, beating. You know, a, a swan will manage a couple of beats per second, and you get smaller and smaller. But so with that scale, that that's the. The, the ridiculous thing is that's actually a huge differential between a honeybee and the and the fruit fly, and yet they're flapping at the same speed. And the honeybee does it by doing a really relatively shallow um, uh, wing stroke compared to the fruit fly, mm. except when it's laden with pollen and or nectar or both. Um, so then it's, it becomes proportionally much heavier and it's weighed down by this burden and it wants as much of it as possible to... to to get back to the to the hive, uh, to, or to spread it around um, and do the pollination, um, and it is uh, what it then does is it increases the angle, so fly it flaps with a deeper wing stroke, um, which is an extraordinary. I and mean, it's like it's a similar feat to the the feats of ants and termites carrying huge amounts or dung beetles, you know, carrying ridiculous weights on their back. 
and it reminds me of the the thing the old thing that uh, they said about Ginger Rogers, which is that she did everything that Fred Astaire did, but backwards and in heels. So he had this uh, incredibly difficult thing. So next time I see her, every, every time I see a honeybee laden with pollen, I think, okay, fair play, yeah, you, nice job, <laughs> Def- defying the laws of physics. Mm-hmm. Um, so the but they also use their wings for other things. So the honeybees, as an example, again, they'll use their wings to um, to keep the hive uh, well ventilated. If the temperature of the hive reaches a certain point, they detect this, and then they gather at the entrance to it and they flap their wings at a slightly smaller rate, at a lower rate, mm-hmm. and to, to waft air through it to, to keep the temperature down. Um, and they also use it to disperse pheromones. Um, and then you will also see... Uh, bumblebees in flowers using a technique called sonication which is when they're getting into the flower and they're buzzing their wings against the um uh, against the, the petals of the petals the uh, lost the words the mid- middle of the flower um uh, and to, to get the pollen that way so the, the 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 wings are used for flying but they also will have in some cases uh, other purposes which again is is a, is a fascinating, uh, fascinating thing. But that's the other thing we've been talking about uh, flight with with the different types of insects. We're still with insects, yeah. And how it's using to to get from one place to the other, or, or maybe one or two other things. But with bees, there's a lot of uses for yeah. for for flight, which is pretty spectacular when I mean, when you think about it. I mean, that's yeah. that one thing is is useful for so many things. Yes, get you from point A to point B, but it's also a lot of other things in terms of labor or sexuality or reproduction or there's all of these different things where it's like, wow, there's so much involved with one component of their behavior. Yeah. Um yes, and then there's the the whole thing of the sociality which is, you know, sim- which is common to all that family, the hymenoptera, the 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 bees, the ants and the wasps. Um, so there are there are uh, species of, of within that group that are all uh, that are social uh, creatures, and that I think you know was a, a huge problem for Darwin when he thought about it. He said, "Hold on, this goes against everything that I, you know. This 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 could blow my theory out of the water." Mm-hmm. And of course, there, there's a lot being learned about that since then. But um, the so the, the swarming is another thing that I found fascinating. Obviously, we we I'm older than you, so I grew up in the the era of uh, schlock B movies, things like you know, the killer bees mm-hmm. um, and, and ants and things like that. So I grew up with a horror of these this, the idea that swarms of bees were setting out to to kill humans <laughs> but of course they're not doing it they're just all they're doing is they're relocating their colony but they do it in such a sophisticated way with the scouts going out to to you know communicate communicating each other with the famous waggle dance and then uh going back to the the swarm and leading them to the the new the place of the new colony um and uh, yeah, that's a whole fascinating and a, a really sort of potentially rich area of study I think. Mm. Mm, yeah, yeah, for sure. So let me let's uh let's let's move to uh pterosaurs. Uh yep. not dinosaurs, but close. <laughs> uh they're reptiles that fly essentially. Uh <laughs> they they have this reptilian uh, component to them. Just tell us about pterosaurs, but mostly how did they change kind of the rules of being really big and able to fly? Uh what's what's yeah. the unique there? Well, so the, I mean, just thinking about the insects. So we've had the insects, and they've been around for a hundred and something million flying insects. You know, with developments all the time and different ones uh, diversifying in different ways. And then uh, suddenly, they around two hundred and thirty something million years ago, uh, these vertebrates start flying. Um, these cousins of dinosaurs that I know in. When I've been giving my talks, I do make to be careful to. I'm careful to make the distinction. Say, firstly, obviously they're not dinosaurs. Some people might know them as pterodactyls. And certainly, that's how in the UK they've been known as a kid. Oh, pterodactyls! Mm-hmm. Um, but but the, the group is known as pterosaurs. Um, for some reason, the name pterodactyl stuck in the public consciousness. Uh, the pterodactylus is, of course, one species of probably more than just over 200 species that we know about. 
Um, and so they, in the first instance, they changed the rules by being flying vertebrates, which was a pretty big deal. And some of them uh, were, of course, hunting those insects that were uh, that had thought they had the air to themselves. So that must have been quite the shock for, for the insects being hunted by these things. Um, and as they uh, grew and diversified, they came in all sorts of different shapes and sizes. But as time wore on, a lot of time wore on, and we came into the Cretaceous, they got uh, generally they got bigger. They didn't all get bigger, so it's not that all pterosaurs went from smallish to you know, the smallest ones were about the size of a sparrow, I think. Mm. Um, but then when you get to the uh, Cretaceous, you see uh, the things like well, Quetzalcoatlus is the 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 most famous one, I think, um, and that is the size of a giraffe standing up. Mm. And it has, uh, and here's an analogy that's going to be completely lost on American listeners, because I always say the wingspan, half the size of a cricket pitch, but you don't know how big a cricket pitch is. But it's, <laughs> it's, the wingspan is up to about 11 metres. Um, <laughs> so whatever you've got, any sporting analogy you know that, that relates to 11 metres, then, then feel free to knock yourselves out. To, I don't to, know how, how big a, uh, a football field is in terms of metres. No, it's 100 um, yards though, isn't it? It's so, 100 yards, so... yeah. So I can't, yeah, I can't do the conversion. <laughs> yeah, it, it's it, it's pretty big. <laughs> it's big. It's big. It's um, um, and uh, I think with with all of these things, it's as with anything uh, paleontological, it's really important to sort of stress how um, sparse the evidence is that the, the people have been working with over these years. How few fossils there are. Mm. Uh, uh, you know, there are obviously there are places where you find a lot of things. But that those lots of things will be the ones that lived in that particular space, place, and there's you know you extrapolate from that that there must be loads of other stuff elsewhere that didn't get preserved. Mm -hmm. And one of the problems with pterosaur research, as I understand it, is that the the their fossil record is particularly sparse. And one of the reasons for that seems to be that they, uh, especially the larger ones. That their bones, uh, the, the, their bones were very, very thin, or the bone walls were extremely thin, so very susceptible to degrading and, and not surviving. Um, but very clever people have worked out that Quetzalcoatlus from this one bone uh, was that size, and so then you have the question of, okay, well, how the hell did it fly if it's that big? Because giraffes can't fly. Elephants can't fly unless they're Dumbo in a cartoon. So, yeah, how is it going to um, how is it going to do it? Um, and I suppose the tying into this is the fact that their respiratory system is incredibly efficient in the same way as you know, reptilians um, and the same way as birds. Our mammalian. Uh, respiratory system is, is very inefficient really it's got this you know air coming in the same way it's going out and so not much comparatively little oxygen gets into the bloodstream so we we, we do quite well but we tire very easily and quickly um so having an efficient uh, way of breathing was one thing with rigid lungs and uh, a system of air sacs, which would be delivering the, the oxygen in a one-way system around the, around the body. Um, they, uh, they had hollow, uh, hollow, uh, hollow wing bones. It, the hollowness of the bones is it's a kind of misleading way of saying it. It's not quite as simple as that because, of course, we all have hollow bones. You know, you take out the marrow, we've got hollow bones. We've also got very thick, won't, uh, thick bone walls. Um, and they also had very uh, large uh, sternums and general chest, musc uh, chest um, anatomy skeletons. So they've got these ex big expanse of bone to which they could attach the flight muscles big enough and strong enough to move these very long wings and they also had a, an extraordinary sort of uh, anatomical feature so if you think about if you jump ahead briefly to bats which have the same hand anatomy as we do so you imagine oh we've got very long fingers all of them going into the membrane at, at, at angles 
So you've got these five uh, fingers, four of them, really going deeply into the membrane, to the tips. Pterosaurs did it differently. They had a sort of normal arm until it reached the, the hand, and then they had three normalish fingers, and they had a fourth finger, which was unbelievably long. And so from that, the membrane hung. And the, the membrane was also not just a sort of flappy canvas thing, but it would have would be shot through with the sort of uh, layers of, of muscle uh, to strengthen it. So um, with all, with all these uh, uh, these features, that would help them to to to, to be able to fly. Um, but there's one the final thing I think that, to mention at this point is that they uh, you know, how would they get in the air? So it's one thing having a big wingspan with a big uh, surface area of wings, which you can kind of soar with mm-hmm. um, and do some you know, some occasional flapping. But uh, how do you get into the air in the first place? And fairly recently, I think they've really worked it out pretty unequivocally that they were these, especially these larger ones were quadrupedal so they were on all they were walking quadrupedally and launching from the ground quadrupedally as well mm. so they would sort of crouch back and then push forward with all four legs up to presumably given the wingspan probably about eight or nine feet up into the air so that they could be high enough to get that first wing stroke in and then up mm. and away um and even you know every time i talk about this i kind of hopefully look out of my window <laughs> thinking you know by some miracle perhaps i'll see one uh, <laughs> over west norwood high street <laughs> yeah it would it would it would be be wonderful i know some people have have have, have, have claimed sightings of them or whatever you hear this every yeah. now and then it's kind of like a yeah. bigfoot sighting or something <laughs> yeah yeah uh, i think i, I think it's, that's vanishingly unlikely isn't it yeah, of but course it, I, right, think, yeah. I think and obviously you know we we, we know because people are imaginative and there's uh there's a there's a lovely sort of uh meeting point of science and art in the world of paleo art mm. so there are people who know a great deal about the anatomy of these things and they're also talented artists so you see these fantastical um scenes mm-hmm. um with creatures that you would just you just really would want to encounter but it brings it to life mm-hmm. um mm-hmm. so the yeah they they were they were pretty amazing pterosaurs i think they were weird as well I mean, they were so disproportionate in some ways so they would have these huge heads and huge head crests um, and massive necks in some cases, really long um, or, or chunky, and you know, really over sort of developed uh, upper bodies, and then really quite feeble down in the leg department and, and, and the, in the lower body. So, by the standards of what we think of as flying things, they would definitely look like as a kind of a cheese dream thing. It's like really, mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. yeah it, um, it would be interesting to be on the planet with them at the same time. I think it'd be yeah. very, very, yeah. very interesting. It would be very cool. <laughs> um, so let's, let's talk about birds. Obviously lots to say, so we can, we can hit the major themes here. So yeah. tell us about the first bird uh, or why we, why we think or classify it as a, as a, as a first bird. I know there's a, always a difference yeah, it's a, with firsts, but. Um, well, there is a huge difficulty with first. So the, the one that is, has been known as the, the first bird for, uh, nearly a couple of hundred years now, is the Archaeopteryx, which is a very famous, uh, there's about a dozen of them now, famous fossils that have been found, uh, a lot of them in the Solnhof and the limestone in Germany. Um, and they, um, so they, the, I suppose the reason that they are known as the first bird is partly because they were the first to be discovered as, uh, you know, as dinosaur birds or as birds. Um, because there are other candidates now that, uh, and the one that springs to mind is called Jautinga, um, and that is kind of, that's about ten million years older, and also kind of bird-like. Um, but the really, and I, I try and avoid defining what the first bird was because it really depends on how you define bird. Because from any point from about then, one hundred and sixty million years ago to the KPG event at the end of the Cretaceous 66-ish million years ago and progressing progressively more bird-like. You would you would have go, you know, in our time machine, you would go back and you would see things that would look uncannily like birds in many ways. 
And if you saw them in your garden on your bird feeders or whatever, you go, oh, there's a bird. Mm -hmm. But then they had teeth or they had bony tails or they had uh, other different anatomical things that mean they're not quite birds in the modern sense. Mm -hmm. But there's certainly, uh, in the, throughout the Mesozoic, there's a whole pile of things that, that could easily be, if you stretch the point, you say, well, that's a bird. Um, so uh, you, it's a, that's a, a, shifting, a shifting definition, I guess. Mm. But um, Archaeopteryx uh, has the fame because it was the first to be discovered, so, um, and also because the fossils in general are extremely good. We've got one here in the Natural History Museum in London. I saw it the other day, and it's just it's fantastic. Mm. Um, about the size of uh, a crow, I guess, mm. maybe a raven, uh, with a long, longish bony tail um, and, as I said, teeth. But it also had the things that feathers that we would recognize as flight feathers, so asymmetric flight feathers mm. that you would get on the the, you know, the primaries of a uh, primary feathers of a flying bird's wing. Mm. Um, but what it didn't have is what you might find on a pigeon, which is that strong uh, breastbone with big big muscles. So it's they reckon that it's more likely to be a glider than a than a strong flapper. Um, but as I say, there was, you know, through that period, there were a large number of things diversifying all, all dinosaurs, um, and all with feathers, um, and a lot of them flying to a greater or lesser degree, probably not flying quite as well as the pterosaurs that were around at the time, because those pterosaurs had, they'd been around for a while. Um, and I think they were, they were, uh, as I understand it, they were probably more agile and better flyers than those early birds. But, you know, it takes a while. <laughs> it takes a while to get good at things. So uh, uh, we, cut, we cut them some slack. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I guess the, the big thing I want to know about <clears throat> uh, flight in birds is, from what we can know or kind of estimate from early birds, how is that helpful – in our understanding of, of modern birds, of how, how they fly or how close they are to each other, what's the kind of evolutionary story of, of birds, uh, his, um, you know, prehistorically till currently, uh, and more specifically in terms of, of flight? Yes. Right. Well, the, the, there's always this question with any of these, um, these flying animals is how did they start? Mm -hmm. how, did it, how did it start? Mm -hmm. um, and with, with the birds, there, there have been... Uh, two basic theories, <laughs> which are kind of uh, fairly obvious if you think about it. The the first one would be that they were went from the ground up, so they'd be running and they would be flapping their wings to try and maybe get a little bit faster, and then they'd gradually get uh, you know, a, a short flight like the Wright brothers, then a longer flight, and then a longer flight, and then you know, look at me, Mara, I'm flying, yay! Mm -hmm. um, and then there's the the trees down model, which is that they jump from a tree and didn't plummet like we would, but they glide a bit and then they glide a bit more and then they glide a bit more and they start flapping and do it that way. And there are problems with both of those uh, models. Um, and then a scientist called Ken Dial um, uh, had a theory, a uh, hypothesis, that, uh, and he did some experiments with partridges, which was having them run up increasing, I'm making things like people can see it, <laughs> they run up increasing uh ramps of, of ever greater angles and see how they used their wings. Because I don't know if uh, we have partridges here, red-legged partridges, and what I've noticed, because we get them in country lanes, so you're driving down a country lane and a partridge is in the road in front of you and it runs and you're doing 10 miles an hour and it keeps on running and you, kind of, you think, look, you have wings. You can fly very easily, and yet it keeps on running. And then only at the last minute, when you're expecting like that, <laughs> it actually takes off and uses the wings that it. So, obviously, there's so many different ways of doing it. Um, and the, the partridges, uh, what Kendall found was that they um, used their wings to help them get up the slope. And the steeper the slope, the more they used their wings. And that was how he. 
formulated the idea that that was how flight actually started. So it was a mixture of the ground up and the trees down, um, which and that seems to be the the idea currently at play. Um, so by the time you get to the the, the KPG event six, six million years ago, you have quite a lot of birds in of uh, bird like things, let's call them, of all sorts of different shapes and sizes. Some of them are flying pretty well. And then loads of stuff gets wiped out. And the things that survived of all animals, the things that survived that extinction, that would survive any extinction, uh, are generally uh, not large, because you don't do well if you're if you're big in an extinction event. Um, and it was helpful if they were uh, generalists rather than specialists. I would say so as a as a general thing. You, so that if things went horribly wrong in one place, then you could go off and eat something else. So you be more diverse for diet, then you'll uh, you'll you'll find more to eat rather than things that are very specialised. They also had, um, unlike pterosaurs, they had hardened eggshells, so the incubation times were were shorter. So their reprodu- reproductive cycle was quicker, and therefore they could you know, they they could weather the storm. They could absorb the blows of these um, uh, of this terrible event. So, uh, and from them, we now have nearly 11,000 species of dinosaur, um, some of them flying around outside my window right now. <laughs> <laughs> Which it's, it's still, you know, I, it's still, every time I say it, goes, it's amazing. It's ridiculous. It is. You uh, said before. It is. It's, it's absolutely, absolutely crazy to think about. Um, okay, so tell us about this, 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 you talk about in the book, this, maybe it's a mystery, I don't know, flightless birds. So we have mm. birds that have wings, but they don't fly, so many people will know. Penguins, the ostrich, um, uh, emus, and uh, emus, kiwis. Yeah, kiwis, uh, right, and there's, right, right. Uh, there's some, some odd ones. Well, there's like there's cormorants as well, and there's um, there's a, a kind of a rail like a coot uh, mm-hmm. type thing. And, uh, so there's yes, and it did. Um, and some people have said, "But hold on, this is a book about flight, and you've got a." a, a a chapter about the penguin what's going on there and i thought well this is actually it's an interesting uh subject because developing flight is uh it's a hard thing to do and you'd have to have a good reason to do it and obviously it has many advantages but the the sacrifices that evolutionarily birds, say birds had to make to go from these ground dwelling things to something that's light enough and but strong enough to to get in the air and stay in the air and to make it useful for it. Those are quite some changes. Um, so then, why would you then, having evolutionarily gone to that those great lengths over millions of years to develop it, why would you then discard it? Um, and so, what happened was that some of these birds uh, found themselves in places with much less competition and places that were, where they were, might be isolated. And of course, uh, over time land masses were floating apart um and so you might find yourself on an island or you might have flown to an island and then find that there's nothing there that's likely to eat you so you can actually kind of moot around on the ground without being in danger of being killed um and so gradually the those things that that were useful become less useful and so you lose their use Uh, penguins were uh, an interesting one particularly Partly because, I mean, there's the other aspect of the flightlessness thing is that, say, there's 11,000 species of bird, give or take, uh, fewer than 100 of them are flightless. Mm-hmm. Um, and yet we know quite a few of them. You know, so about, about 20 of those are penguins. And then you have the ostriches and cassowaries and uh, all those, that family. So that they are. They're they're cute and they're, they're glamorous and they're fun and you know people make films about them. It's the, the, cas- the, the cassowary is the one that looks the most like old dinosaurs and how yeah, we think of them. Yeah, it's so they're, wild. They're, the they're feet and it's wild. It's yeah, wild. Yeah. And the sort of nobles on the heads and the colors. Yes. Absolutely. Yes. And and, um, and what's the what's the other one? The the the, the shoe bill. It's very strange. Oh my shoe goodness. Shoe bill. Yeah. Cool. Oh cool. wow. You wouldn't want one of those wandering into your back. <laughs> 
<laughs> there's a yeah. there's a there's a there's a distinctly I don't like anthropomorphizing, but it, there's almost a humanness to it. It, it yeah. looks almost like it's got like a soul in its eyes. It's very, yeah, very off it It's about them. Uh, yeah, so they're just kind of stalk, aren't they? So the, the yeah, so those um, I, I do quite like anthropomorphizing, but you know, I do, it's a it's a dangerous it's a dangerous thing to do. Uh-huh. Um, but with penguins, I think part of the appeal is also that uh, they kind of remind us of ourselves because they walk. They they walk upright and mm-hmm. they you know they look like waiters and you know so and they're, <laughs> and they're kind of cute. Um, so th- in their case, they stood they didn't lose the use of their wings. So a kiwi basically has very vestigial wings and doesn't use them at all. The ostrich does does actually have um, surprisingly large wings, which it will use to help it corner and, and to help it maneuver while running. And they run at a tremendous pace, as you know. Um, uh, but for penguins, the, the, it was to do with the environment, uh, almost exclusively the Southern Hemisphere birds and down the Antarctic. Um, and uh, they found themselves in a situation where it was more useful to them uh, gradually over many years to be able to get around in the water than it was to get around in the air. So they developed the, those, those flippers, which are slimmed down and no, not nearly good enough to get them in the air. But once you get them in the water, they are fantastically useful paddles. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, the, the, the figures that, you know, emperor penguins can dive down to extraordinary depths and stay underwater for uh, a very long time. And that makes them incredibly effective um, uh, hunters. And, and, of course, they are also extremely funny when they come out of the water and sort of boop and land on the ice like that. Mm-hmm. So um, yeah, they are uh, they they are very endearing and but they're also extremely interesting um, from that point of view. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they, they're, they are interesting. Flight, flightless birds are 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 very interesting because you as you're as you're describing here. They do much, many times, not always, but they do use their wings not mm. for flight, but sort of for these kind of ancillary kind of reasons. Yeah, um, which I think is 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 interesting. Also, there before before we move on to to, to bats, because bats are super fascinating. Yeah, uh, I do want to ask about the hummingbird, another mm. fascinating uh, bird because it's so small, yeah, super fast, um, and there's so many amazing things you can talk about. Whatever you want about the the hummingbird. Um, but I am curious about their fast metabolism uh, and how how that's a, a a key part here. So just tell us a little bit about the hummingbird. Yeah, so the hummingbirds. Um, uh, I, I try not to hold a grudge against your part of the world because you have hummingbirds and we don't, and it really sticks in my craw. Because I, I, really, really, <laughs> so I have, I have, seen, I have seen them like out in nature. Like I've gone to yeah. like a, a gardens or whatever botanical gardens or whatever, and you'll see they're not. You don't just walk outside and see hummingbirds, but you can, yeah. if you go to certain areas, you will see them kind of out in the yeah, wild, sure. yeah. and it is special. It's very it special. special. I mean, the, the, the first time I encountered them in my life was, was and I tell this story in the book, is that uh, um, I'd, I was jet lagged and I'd flown from the UK to Canada and mm-hmm. was staying with friends in Toronto. And a semi-rural kind of, you know, not a suburban kind of area. Yeah. And I was just sort of sitting there in their kitchen looking out the window vaguely with a cup of coffee, kind of trying to stay awake. And then look, I saw, oh, they've got some bird feeders, but those bird feeders don't look like the bird feed. What the hell is going on? Then something zipped in. I go, what the fuck was that? <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, yeah, I've never seen this before. What is this? <laughs> what? <laughs> and they say, okay, it's hummingbirds. Hummingbirds. Oh my God. Because I'd grown up thinking that these were creatures of the Amazonian rainforest. You know, you had to go to Colombia or somewhere. So to find them in downtown Toronto was quite the surprise. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, yes. So the, the the aspect of hummingbirds, I could we could have done these whole two and a half hours on, on them. But briefly, um, of course, they are what. I think what fascinates me about them um, is the fact that, like things like an albatross or an ostrich or the, the, the shoebill stalk, they are pushing at the limits of what it is to be a bird. Mm. Mm. That they're, they're right at the very, and they're, you know, they're, they fly uh, unlike any other bird. They have specially sort of modified shoulder joints. They have a ball and socket kind of affair, which means that rather than doing a sort of modified up and down flap. Um, 
like most no, all other birds, they can do something more similar to an insect's um, uh, wing motion, which is a flattened figure of eight. And the the result of this is that rather than doing downstroke to produce lift and then upstroke trying to avoid producing too much drag and so you can have that balance they're also producing lift on the upstroke apparently it's about it's depending on the species again but about 70 percent lift on the downstroke and then 30 percent on the upstroke and they're doing it very quickly for a bird not quickly for an insect but quickly for a bird uh up to sort of 75 times a second and which enables them to do the most difficult thing in powered flight which is to hover which is, you know, because you're suspend you're suspending yourself as if motionless with your with the power of your own uh, flapping, um, and uh, so that's quite a wonderful thing. And obviously, they do that so that they can be in front of the the flower and they can get their long, specially adapted bills in there and suck the nectar. And the glorious thing about that is that while they're doing that, they're getting their forehead close to the the trumpet of the flower. And the pollen will stick to their forehead, and then they go on to the next one. And so they are, uh, in many cases, wonderful pollinators as well. Mm. So the and the nectar, of course, is extremely important because with those very very fast metabolisms, they need to be consuming pretty much constantly mm-hmm. in order to in order to function. They're like they're like um, Olympic swimmers. They have to do yeah, like you know, tons of calories per day. <laughs> yeah, all all the, all the time. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, but the, they also have, um, like some other birds, uh, and particularly the higher uh, they go, uh, the higher the, the ones that live in the uh, in mount, higher mountains, they have the ability to put themselves into a state of torpor overnight. So they will slow the metabolism down, which enables them to survive. Mm-hmm. Um, so that again is an, a very extreme adaptation. Mm. Um, and doing things pretty much unlike what you'd expect of a bird. And then, there's, of course, there's the size. So the smallest uh, bird in the world, and therefore the smallest dinosaur ever to have lived, is uh, a species that is uh, endemic to Cuba called the bee hummingbird, mm. and that is just two inches long wow. and five, weighs five grams. Uh, so, and I've never seen one. Obviously, I've never been to Cuba, but I know people who have seen them. And I said, "Did you think? Did you, what did you think?" He said, "Well, basically, I thought it was an insect until I realised that it was actually the, the behind the that that wee and that kind of yeah." So they're they're just kind of freaky yeah. um, and yeah. amazing. Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah I, I find them more and more fascinating. Is, is they're one of those those animals that you learn more, and you're just like you know, your mind just keeps exploding the more you learn about them. They're fascinating. I, I don't know if it's been published, but he'd be in, in the States, but a very good person to talk to about hummingbirds if you want to do a program about all about hummingbirds uh, is my friend John Dunn, who's mm. wrote, who wrote a book called The Glitter in the Green. Oh, so you should, you should look that up. It's, yeah, uh, yeah, for sure. Super, it's all about hummingbirds, all about his quest to see hummingbirds. Oh, um, and it's full of, it's full of, you know, proper knowledge, you know, yeah. kind of accumulated yeah. knowledge. Oh, over. That sounds great. Yeah, uh, yeah that sounds it's really great. great. Yeah. Okay, so we'll, we'll we'll end as you do in the book, or, or close to it. We're about bats. Bats are mammals, um, and I think this is right. It's uh, I think something along the lines of of uh, humans, rats, and bats make up a fifth of the population of the world's animals, or something like that. It's something like something um, crazy. That might be. So I, I didn't know that one, but uh, sometimes it would feel like that the, the uh, that's interesting, isn't it? Because, um, yeah, there's a lot of us, and there's probably a lot of rats. <laughs> there's, a, there's a. I looked it up one day. There's more. I believe there's more rats than humans. I could be wrong on that, but it's oh, it's well, in the it's in the billions. Yeah. It's in the billions. Oh, yeah. Rock yeah. me to sleep with that one. That's gonna be yeah. Great. That's <laughs> well, where where there's humans, there's rats usually, and then bats that's also good. are quite numerous. Um, there's a, well, there's there's about fourteen hundred species, and I think in some parts of the world they are incredibly numerous. So mm-hmm. uh, that mm-hmm. doesn't surprise me. Mm-hmm. And what's of course the the fundamental thing to the first thing to say about them is that they are our closest relatives that fly of all these things that fly they are they're closest to us and yet of course we have this um should we say mixed relationship with them Um, (laughs) we certainly do we certainly do (laughs) uh, so they they are yeah and, and, and 
uh, I have friends who work for the Bat Conservation Trust uh, here in the UK, and they go, it's just, they're so gorgeous and they're adorable. And we just, all we want to do is communicate what, what brilliant things they are to people. And yet they carry with them this sort of the burden of all sorts of things. There's the nocturnality thing, first thing. There's all sorts of terrible folklore that, oh, they'll get in your hair. They'll do, you know, the, and, and then there is, of course, the, the, the terrible thing of disease carrying, which is a real, uh, you know, it's a real thing. It's not mm-hmm. as, um, and I, somebody pointed this out as a, as a, a UK writer, we don't have rabies. So for, for us, uh, bats don't carry that kind of risk in the same way, mm-hmm. um, as they might do in countries where rabies is a, a real danger. So, but of course there are other diseases as well known about the, the, about that thing um and i think the one of those fascinating things is that they carry these diseases and yet they don't die of them themselves well that's that's the real fascinating thing about them is that yeah. they're not only that like look that would be interesting in and of itself if this was like i don't know sheep or something right like another yeah. or i don't know another kind of animal but it's the fact that not only are they mammals like us and that there's so mm. many of them but they're mm. the closest to to humans uh in terms of a flight and mm. They can carry all these diseases and, and not die. We can't do that. And, yeah, and, yeah. And, and, but they're mammals like us. And it's, well, what is it about bats that can carry many diseases and not die from it? So this is, uh, this is not really not my department at all, but I have to, um, uh, but, but it is slightly, I understand that it is slightly related or could be related to the evolution of flight. Mm, for, the, the, for the following reason that they uh they have like hummingbirds they have a very fast metabolism mm-hmm. um and they also have high body temperatures um and so again that the, their bodies are working at a at quite a, you know, a high rate and a sustained high rate um and in order to counter the the damage that that kind of uh evolutionary path can can do to animal DNA into its system. They have also developed uh, immune systems um, that enable them to repair uh, more easily. So they have strong immune systems. So I, I, as I understand it, that is how they can be vectors for uh, these diseases, which are fatal to other things, but not suffer them from them themselves. That's what I, that my scant understanding of it is that that's how it works. Mm-hmm. And it's fascinating that it, that it is, in a way, a, a byproduct of their having evolved flight, which, mm-hmm. in, which necessitates their having these the extraordinary fast metabolism for mammals. Because, of course, the other thing is with the, uh, they are burdened by the mammalian lungs, mammalian uh, breathing system. Mm-hmm. So they have to overcome that. To do to to do the the high energy uh, activity of flight, mm. so uh, yeah, they're 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 pretty amazing. What what is it about flight in bats that's very distinct? So they're flying at night, right? And and they yeah. and they have <clears throat> uh, they they're not completely blind, are they? I know they use echolocation, no, which is which is huge, but they're not blind, no, right? No, they're not. That's again, that's a, that's a myth. They have they have pretty good functional. Uh, again, depends on the, the the species, and there are um some there there are some day flying bat species. There mm-hmm. are some mm-hmm. that that will be crepuscular, so they'll be active most of you know mostly around dusk and dawn. Um. And so the, the eyesight thing is a bit of a, a, a red herring. Um, but the echolocation thing is also they're not the only things that echolocate. Right. Um, you know, uh, so th- with all of these things, then they're, they're not the only ones that do it. Um, but the, the evolution of that is, is fascinating because, again, you go, well, so how did that evolve? What order did it happen in? And again, like the pterosaurs, uh the um the uh, the fossil record of bats is extraordinarily sparse um so we don't have any proto bat fossils we just have these things uh that turned up after the kpg so this is to do with the rise of the mammals as well so this is yeah you know, um 
from, from after 66 million years ago that, that, that they that they started uh, um, getting into the air. Um, and uh, so the big question is: so what? How would that happen? Would the 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 echolocation um, come? And again, there's different uh, hypotheses about it. One, and again, obviously, as with the birds, you've got the potential extremes. Either echolocation came first before flight, or flight came before echolocation, or it's a mixture of the two. So with often these things, there's two uh, opposing hypotheses, and then there's a middle path, and that tends to be the one that is more favoured these days. So the idea with the if the echolocation came first, then you'd have, say, imagine a mammal that's perching on a tree. And it's got good eyesight, and it's got a quite a strong sense of smell. And it's what it's doing to eat is it's grabbing things, flying things from from its perch with long limbs, and it's communicating with a sort of kind of ultrasound clicking thing with with each other. Um, and then it evolves to have longer limbs because you can reach more prey that way. Um, and then actually it evolves webbing between the fingers, which might be quite handy to, to you know, to pouch more. Um, and then the ultrasound becomes more sophisticated, so it can start to actually, you know, detect smaller things and faster things. Um, and then it starts not just reaching further, but actually jumping out and gliding because it's got a webbing so it can glide and then, and and there you go. So that's the idea. Um, and then with the flight first, the idea is that actually it just uh, they they learned how to fly first, um, and then the, the 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 supporting argument with this is that the, there's a connection between flapping and echolocation. So producing the sounds required to echolocate is energetically quite expensive. They're very loud. Um, and so if you can coordinate the, those sounds with the not only your flapping stroke, but also your breath, your, your upstroke, but also your breath, then that gives you that free of energetic charge, as it were. So you're, you know, you're not making a separate effort to make the sound. It comes with the, the upstroke and the exhalation of the breath. Um, so those are the two the, the two ideas, and I think recent uh, thinking is that it's somehow there's a that they kind of co-evolved mm. side by side, um, and now we have these extraordinary extraordinary things. Mm. Um, yeah, it's, it's it's interesting how that works, and and you talked about the different um, you know species. One of the, the fascinating uh, species of bats is. <clears throat> the uh the flying fox which, mm. which i'm going to be i'm going to be very yeah. honest is eerily similar to a human with wings i mean i'm going to yeah. I mean, they're so big and and they're like the size of a human and their face uh, has you, you can definitely say yes that's a mammal yeah. um yeah, I don't know if you. I don't think you mentioned in the book, but what what do you what do you what do you know about the flying fox or I, I, some well, ideas about I, it? I mentioned them. I think I mentioned them in the context of their being the um, the largest, aren't they? So, mm -hmm, the, the, mm -hmm. the, so that's the up, kind of the upper limit, as it were, of of, of uh, bat uh, of bat flight. Um, so they do. They they are very because uh, they, they don't. They have good eyesight. They have big eyes as well. That's one of the things that they uh, re remind. They don't, of. they don't echolocate. I don't think. No, right? they don't echolocate. So they they actually they have incredibly good sense of smell. Uh -huh. uh, so they'll be uh, you know they'll be locating their food um, with with their, their with their sense of smell. So the in in terms of the the, the flying thing, I suppose I, to be honest, this uh, part of the the book. Um, the, the part of the the reason I've been, you know, I wrote the book the way I did, it was it was for a UK audience, uh, so it was really dealing uh, in this case with the bats that we have in mm -hmm. in the UK. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, they are, you know, uh, they're not something we have over here. So uh, I think they're Southeast Asia and elsewhere. Mm -hmm. So they're not they're not really part of of what I know. But the 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 fact that they, as you say, they 
and I suppose they're also known as fruit or have been known as fruit bats, haven't they? So, right, right. Um, uh, that that's a it's, it's a different. It's almost like it's a different uh, um, area because, of course, they're not they're not using their flight for hunting so much because mm-hmm. you don't need to hunt the hunt the fruit. You just <laughs> go go and get it. But having the sense of smell means that they are extremely you know good at finding it. Mm-hmm. So. Um, but I think, as you say, that uh, when you have something that looks so so like us mm-hmm. or so similar to us, that mm-hmm. is that endearing, or does it make it more creepy that they in fact they can fly? For me, it's both at the same time. Yeah, it's a it's <laughs> yeah. a strange yeah. thing. I'm I'm equally fascinated and like, wow, that's that's so feels close. And at mm. the same time, it's like, whoa, that's really kind of scary at the same time. I, I feel both at the same time. So a sense of, I guess I feel my sense of awe negatively and positively there. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's it's, what it is. It's both, it's both awesome and awful. Yeah. <laughs> right, right, right. Exactly. <laughs> um, so, so the last question I have is, mm. um, you know, you, you've written this, this, this marvelous book on, on flight in, in different animals and what is the, I guess, the major takeaway in an animal's survival on the planet by evolving flight? Mm. And and what do we know about, um, again, not to contextualize, obviously, with, with humans, obviously, but, you know, mm. we we fly um, in terms of we get in an airplane or we get in, a, yeah. in a, a balloon or whatever, and I guess we soar or something like that. We, we have instruments that help us fly. So mm. what is that? I guess, how does understanding this evolutionary story of flight in general for a kind of a natural science, but then also how we build in devices for flying and things like that as well? Yeah, because we're, you know, we're problem solvers, you know, and we, and we can, we can build we, things. We try and, to be, we try to be. <laughs> yeah, well, and, and we've developed the technology to do these things. And obviously there's been quite, um, quite a strong impulse for us to do it. To, to try and get in the air because it's something we we want to do mm-hmm. want to be able to do and you know um uh, it, it, if you've got a spare hour or two you can go on youtube and look up um uh, uh, man's early attempts to fly and the, 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 some of the contraptions that they that we built it's always it's always guys you know building these strapping wings to their arms or these sort of things that go up and bounce up and down and extraordinary machines so the efforts that we've made you know you're going back to leonardo da vinci and his his um uh designs of flying machines and his sketches of of kites and uh, other birds to see to try and work out how to do it and yet the fact remains that we are um we're not even close to doing it as well. And I write a bit about this in the uh, in the book about dragonflies. How you know, we, with all our technology, even though we are getting insanely good at building um, flying robots, we're still not anywhere close to doing something as effectively as a as a dragonfly does. Um, you know, given it's had a couple of hundred million years head start, but um, but I think it does. Uh, I and mean, my takeaway is, has been this sort of growing sense of um of wonder at all the different ways that it's done mm. and the different points on the spectrum that the it occupies but also this idea that again coming back to the human point of view we think our way of doing things is normal mm. but in fact as non-flyers we are very much in the minority because by by far the majority of species and things on the planet do fly um so again it just shifts your shifts your focus a little bit um uh, i think that is just a, it's just again it's a it's a useful and interesting thing to do and i think it's also to do with taking it for granted um which is because it is all around yeah. us mm. and yet i think a lot of people don't really and i didn't for many years i didn't really think that at all deeply about it mm-hmm. just kind of you know okay they fly but actually we should be going jesus they fly mm, yeah, that's right. um, yeah. yeah how do they do it why do they do it and, you know uh, so that's i suppose that's just a general vague kind of takeaway which is mm-hmm. uh, a little bit of, uh, wow isn't it amazing mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. but let, yeah. let's have a look let's have a look at it and not take it for granted yeah no I, absolutely well, the, the book is called Taking Flight, The Evolutionary Story of Life on the Wing. 
and I believe it's out everywhere now, and everyone should go pick up a copy and and uh, and, and and read all about it. Uh, Lev, this was uh, so much fun. I, I really, really enjoyed you know the two hours we we spent talking about your book and and talking about flight and all the the wondrous things about uh, these animals that can fly. So I, I I have a big 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 thanks for you for taking your time and and, and sharing all the things you learned. And likewise, thank you so much for inviting me on. And you've been, as I've listened to several of your um, podcasts uh, already, and you always engage in an amazingly diverse range of subjects. And you always manage to draw things out and ask the intelligent questions and uh, things to get the best out of people. So that's been a real pleasure as well. So thank I, you so much. I, I greatly appreciate that. And um, I, uh, again, big thanks. Brilliant. All right.